So you're a smart consumer. You knew better than to buy into a new socket from AMD in year one and boy, were you right. I mean, we had memory stability issues, boards frying chips, chips frying boards, vendors blaming AMD, AMD blaming vendors, RMA issues galore. It, it felt like a train wreck at point. And then you looked over at Intel and yikes. You decided to hold off until the 800 series board started dropping. Well, now they're here and you are dead set on building with AMD's undisputed king of gaming, the 7800X3D, or possibly the new soon to be released slash already released, depending on when you're watching this video, 9800X3D, or heck, maybe even some possible future chip because AMD has already said they'll be supporting this socket for at least two more years, which means we get one more generation and if AM4 is anything to go off of, possibly a whole lot more. Now you just have one question, which one to go with? Does it even matter? Can you save some money and go with a 600 series board from last generation? And I hear what you're saying, Bert, that's three questions, not one. You're right. Hey, told you guys you were smart consumers. Don't worry, we got you covered. We will be looking at tons of 800 series boards in the coming months. Today we're kicking it off with my personal choice for now, Asus's new Tough Gaming. <laughs> Asus's new Tough Gaming X870 Plus Wi Fi. Before we jump into the specifics of this board, there is something I want to get out of the way. And that's the fact that whether you're talking about this generation or last, in terms of raw performance, you are not going to see a major difference. And that holds true for any motherboard across the board, at least in our testing and in the testing that other reviewers have done. And I'll make sure to link everything down in the description. But the reality is that in synthetic benchmarks, nearly all of these mid tier and up boards fall within margin of error of each other, say a percent or two. And that should be expected considering what you pay for a motherboard these days. But there are two major things these X870 boards add, both of which you can get a good look at just from the rear IO. The first is the inclusion of USB 4 and the second is adding Wi-Fi 7. With USB 4, we're talking transfer speeds in the range of 40 gigabit per second and for a lot of you, that's not that important. But for anyone that deals with massive amounts of data, content creators, streamers, video editors, people that want to throw this into a production rig, that is a huge improvement over the last generation. The second thing, Wi-Fi 7, I don't think it's going to matter as much to a lot of you out there yet, but it should. Look, I get it. Routers, mesh networks for Wi-Fi 7 are still prohibitively expensive. But if you get a chance to use it, I think it will legitimately blow you away. I don't know if I'm ready to recommend everybody running out there and upgrading to Wi-Fi 7, especially for those of us that live in poor broadband areas. But as it becomes more affordable, trust me, you are going to be very happy that you have it included. Let's jump into the specifics of this board and we'll kick it off where we always do in my reviews. That's with build quality in VRM. So we have a 16 2 in one stage power delivery rated at 80 amps. That's compared to 14 2 and 2 at 70 amps for last year's X670 Tough Gaming. Does that make a difference? Not really. Most mid tier and up boards from the big four manufacturers have long included robust high quality power delivery systems. Don't get me wrong, at $310 for the board, any upgrade is appreciated, if not expected, especially considering AMD's new tendency to extend these sockets for as long as they can to squeeze as many chips as possible out of them. But for now, it's really just a nice to have, not a need to have. But it is nice to have it. What I do love is some of the quality of life features that have been added. ASUS has significantly improved the Q-release latch system for the board's main PCIe slot, 
which they've had this for a while on some of their models, not on last year's Tough Gaming, but on some of the higher end models. But in the past, it's previously just been a button and now it's this full latch lever system, which if you're someone like me that is consistently switching things out, dropping GPUs in, working with a test bench, something small like that can be huge. The latch is functional. It's easy to access, just pretty much all you can ask for in something like this, especially considering it wasn't included on last year's model. Again, not a huge upgrade, but one of those small quality of life improvements that might justify paying up for a new board. While on the topic of PCIe, we have two PCIe expansion slots with the top main GPU slot being rated at PCIe 5 by 16, um, and your bottom secondary slot being rated at PCIe Gen 4 running at by 4. Unlike last year's model, instead of a PCIe Gen 3 expansion slot right here, we actually have improved heat sinks for the chipset as well as another M.2. In fact, since we're talking about the M.2s and the heat sinks, let's go ahead and get these off the board so we can see underneath. Another massive quality of life feature here, Haptis screws. Anybody that has spent I'm not gonna say hours, but significant amounts of time digging around the bottom of cases for drop screws will understand. Such a little thing can mean so much. As far as the heat sinks go, they're not quite as robust as some of the higher end boards I've taken a look at. I do think they're gonna be fine for dissipating heat. You might see a little heat buildup in your main um, Gen 5 slot if you're actually running a Gen 5 NVMe drive. Personally, I don't think you should be, at least not yet. The price difference doesn't really justify the performance difference that you see. But hey, you do you. I'm not going to stop you from that. To be clear, I still think these are more than substantial enough for any drive you're likely to be running, especially if it's just PCIe Gen 4, which you should be using. Spend that money elsewhere in your build. I'm watching you. I'm not really watching you. This is your money, guys. Spend it however the hell you want. Doesn't matter to me. I'm just a dude trying to help out. Once again, I know it's hard to see on the video while it's sitting on the test bench. We also have quick release, Q release on the M.2 slots as well. Again, if you're like me, I know I've said it over and over and I'll keep saying it. I hate dealing with small screws. Anything you can do to either remove a screw, make it captive where I can't drop it, anything to make my life like 5% easier and you're gonna make me pretty happy. Now that we're looking at the M.2 heat sinks, this is something that is very important. I get this question on every single motherboard review and even though I'm saying how important it is, I'm gonna get this question at least 30 times down in the comments. If you are populating out your M.2 drives, the second slot, M.2-2, does share PCI lanes with your main GPU slot. Let me repeat that again. If you populate this drive, this slot will be cut in half and run at X8. It likely will have no impact on your gaming. Even if you're rolling with a 4090, you're still gonna get full performance at PCIe Gen 5 by eight. However, going forward, that may not always be the case. It is my recommendation, if you are using two M.2s, you populate your main boot drive right here in the main PCIe Gen 5 slot, skip dash two, and put your secondary drives in PCIe dash three and four. So again, just to be clear, these two share lanes. If you populate it, if you populate this, you will half this down to X8. Does it matter a lot? Not really, but it could matter in the future. So why don't you do yourself a favor, put a drive here, put a drive here and pretend this guy doesn't exist. Moving on to the dim slots, like all X670 boards and a lot of the mid-tier X870s, the board supports up to 192 gigabytes of DDR5, up to 8,000 mega transfers a second. On the higher end boards, you're gonna see that number going a lot higher. 
those are gonna be the boards with Asus's Nitro Path, which I can't wait to get my hands on those and test them. But for now, this board caps out at 8,000. There's a major caveat to that that I wanna disclose. I don't test anything over 6,000. I found that to be the sweet spot. Asus says it's the sweet spot. I'll link another thing down in the description that shows you don't start seeing any advantage on AMD builds from higher RAM speeds until you cross into almost 9,000 mega transfers. And the chances of you getting that consistently stable are zero. So for now, save yourself some money, find a really, really good 6,000 mega transfer DDR5 kit. I like to use the ones from G-Skill. I'll have that link down in the description. To me, it doesn't matter what you go with. Pretty much any quality RAM manufacturer is gonna have a good low latency 6,000 megahertz kit. Just like we talked about with the M.2s, you can put whatever you want in your build, but it's important to make smart decisions and allocate your money where it will give you the most benefit. At least for me, I don't have an infinite supply. Some of you may. And if you do, have I told you about our Patreon and channel memberships? Now that that's out of the way, if you are going with an overclock kit, and let's be honest, you are. The board obviously supports AMD Expo, but it also comes with ASUS's Enhanced Memory Profile AEMP to give you a little more tuning ability whenever you're down there in your RAM settings, overclocking everything in the BIOS. Switching over to rear IO, hopefully you guys can see all of this, and I'm throw a graphic up on the screen showing everything. Right off the bat, we see another one of those quality of life improvements. Again, it is such a small thing, but it's so appreciated for someone that hates screwing things. No pun intended. Look at that. The Q attachment for the Wi-Fi. It just snaps in. No more fumbling. But that's not the only thing they did. Asus also claims up to 18% better signal strength from their wireless antenna. Now, I don't have a way to test that, so we're going to have to take their word for it. But at the end of the day, I don't think Wi-Fi signal strength is the end-all, be-all deciding factor for you. See how easy that pops off? It's amazing. The little things make me so happy. Moving on is where we find my favorite new feature that we've already touched on a little bit, and that's the inclusion of USB 4 on these boards. You'll see you have two 40 gigabit Type-C USB ports on the back right here, both supporting USB. Um, we also have Realtek 2.5 gig networking. The board also supports BIOS flashback, and of course has plenty enough USB Type-A supports to handle any configuration you can possibly think of. Take a look at the front IO. It's pretty much your standard offerings. One thing of note is the front USB Type-C port now supports up to 30 watt power delivery. Would it be cool if it was 100? Yeah, but that's still pretty nice to have. And again, something not included on the prior generations. Speaking of differences from the prior generation, while we have the board facing this direction, I do want to point out that there is now only two SATA ports. Um, I believe there were four in the prior generation. Is that going to really affect you? No, but it's a change and I think it's something worth noting that you might want to be aware of. It could be a hindrance to your specific middle. I think for most people these days, two, or in my case, zero SATA ports is more than enough. While we're taking a look at this, let's go ahead and talk about the rest of the internal headers. There's dedicated AIO and pump headers at one amp and three amp respectively. You have addressable RGB headers and you have a host of overcurrent protected fan headers to make wiring up your system for any cooling configuration an absolute breeze. Don't overthink this, but to be fair for most manufacturers, it's really not something you wanna overthink. Finally, guys, I wanna to touch on audio. Look, audio is not my forte. I am not a huge audiophile. I can barely tell the difference from multi-thousand dollar baller setups to kinda meh, Bluetooth speakers. But for a lot of you, it is something important. So the board supports Realtek's ALC 1220P codec with support for DTS audio, as well as pretty nice shielding that should provide it a little bit of insulation or protection from any of the electrical interference going on inside your case. Before we wrap, I do wanna go back and briefly touch on aesthetics again, because guys, this is a sexy board. 
And for those of you that think that doesn't matter, you are wrong. There are millions of PC enthusiasts out there that put massive amounts of effort, not only into designing the best performing system out there, but also the best looking. When we're talking about the overall marketability of a board and whether or not you should buy it, aesthetics definitely come into play. You also have the fact that ASUS through the Tough Gaming Alliance is working with dozens of other manufacturers out there to make sure that you have a consistent aesthetic throughout all of your components. Look, when you're dropping a couple thousand dollars on a total bill, looking good absolutely matters. I genuinely care what my rig looks like and as petty as a lot of people may think that is, so do millions of other enthusiasts out there. So who's this board for and should you buy it? If you are already on AM5 and you are rocking any X670 or mid-tier higher B650 board, unless you specifically need Wi-Fi 7 or USB 4, I'd stay put. If you're on a tight budget and you're having to make decisions between allocating your money to CPU, GPU, storage, or motherboard, again, I'd rather see you go with a B650 or an X670 and allocate that money elsewhere in your budget. You'll probably get a better overall experience. But if your budget allows, and at $310, it's not that big of a splurge by modern motherboard pricing standards. You care about USB 4 or Wi-Fi 7. You plan to ride the AM5 platform into the sunset and into the ground, or you care about aesthetics, then maybe, just maybe, this board's the right fit for you. From a personal standpoint, I've already slotted it into my test bench and it's replaced my old B650E as my go-to test board. 